Revelation chapter 3, uh, verse 14 is where we're going to be. And Jesus is addressing the church of the goodness of God. Has God been good to you? Say amen. amen. And I know we can say that like, yeah, I mean, like there's, there's good things. Let, let me just tell you, I mean, you just start and think about how God has blessed our church. God has blessed Americans. God has blessed us in so many ways. I was walking from one building to the over, and I, I go across the parking lot. And do you know what I found? Uh, they just filled the parking lot. It was cars everywhere. There was cars out in the parking lot, which means that most of you did not walk to church today. And inside that car, for most people, there was probably air conditioning that you turned on. And you left a house that had air conditioning. You left a house, by the way. And inside that house is a refrigerator. In that refrigerator, you probably grabbed food. And there was probably a coffee maker. And you had coffee. Or you stopped and you got coffee. And all of these things, let me remind you, is just the goodness of God. And we, we, um, we were on vacation. And one night, me and Jordan just stayed up later than everybody else. We were watching movies, hanging on the couch. And... I was like, are you kind of hungry? I'm kind of hungry. And Jordan was like, hey, I've got an idea. And he says, we, we, could, go get food, or we could get food. And I'm like, I don't want to go anywhere and do anything right now. It's like 1 o'clock in the morning. And Jordan was like, it's already done. And then so they, they just, minutes later, they just knock on our door and deliver food right to, I mean, it's like manna from heaven. It's just bam. There's that food. And just like only in America can you have chicken nuggets delivered to your door. We're spoiled can order groceries, drive up in Walmart, they bring them out to your car. You don't even have to walk down aisles anymore to get your groceries. You can pre-order food and walk in there and grab it off the counter. And just, we sit there and say, what, what are you saying? We have blessings on every angle of our life. We can be so blinded and you say, well, things aren't great. Have you turned on the news? Your life would get better if you turned off the news. Okay, let me give you some spiritual advice. Go home and don't turn on the news. It is discouraging. It's distracting. And you don't know what to believe anyways when it comes out. We, we, we have been blessed by God in so many ways. And do, do we have problems in our world? Yes. But you have to trip over 20 blessings before we get to every one of our problems that we have. This, this letter is about this. But have you ever thought that maybe some of our blessings actually hurt us? They do. Our blessings can hurt us. Seven letters, Jesus pours his heart, heart out to them, seven different churches, but then he puts them in, uh, in order to us because they apply to us, they're important to us. Before we read about heaven, before we read about the rest of Revelation, we come to this passage. And it's, it's this description of a very blessed church is what it was. They were just very blessed he says in verse 14, And to the angel of the church of Laodiceans write, These things say at the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou art cold or hot. So because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because, because thou sayest, I am rich. I'm increased with goods. I have need of nothing, and thou knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor, blind and naked. This church became so comfortable. I mean, they, they, they were, he says, I know thy works. So again, Jesus is writing to an active church. He said, I know what you got going on. You got programs. You got people showing up for church. And you got people doing worship service and all these other things. And the, the city that they lived in was a very rich, wealthy city. They, they had a lot of things, a lot of entertainment, a lot of resources, a lot of blessings. In our culture, it would be like there's restaurants in every corner, and there's the mall, and there's all these things that you can entertain, and AMC theater and stuff. They just were very blessed. They weren't needy at all. They, they would sit there and say, how's things going? Things are great. Why? Because we have all these things. Jesus was telling them that you've gotten so wrapped up in your blessings that they begin to distract you. They still went to church and everything, but it was like, but with, with jobs and entertainment and things like that, he'd say, man, your passion is all of these things. You love these things, and church and God and your relationship with God is kind of a, a, a side thing. Church, was, church is a great way to celebrate God, but it's not the only encounter you should have with God. 
And sometimes we view that as just like, I'm a Christian. Well, tell me about that. I go to church every Sunday. It's like, I'm a father. Tell me about it. I see my kids once a week. It's like, it's just, wait a minute. I have a relationship with my kids. I love my kids. I encounter my kids. I raise my kids. This church was saying, hey, we're, we're still attending. Hey, we still show up. We do all these things. I'm not running from God. Things are okay. If you were to ask that church, and sometimes that's a, the, the, how are things going spiritually in your life? This church would have answered that question like this. Things are okay. You know, I mean, I mean we're not having a revival or anything, but uh, let me just be honest. Things, things are okay. Dear church, letter from God, letter from Jesus to the church. Dear church, being okay is not okay. Their church being okay is not okay. Now listen to, as I explain this, Jesus was giving them an illustration. And so he says this, and he's rebuking them, and he's correcting this issue, but he gets into this. And let me say, the church out of Laodicea is the church that we are most familiar with as Christians today, because it is the one that's most preached about. It's the most applicable to us. Some of you... Uh, the church of Smyrna and the church of uh, you know, all the ones at Philadelphia and all those other ones, you'd be like, I've heard of that. But the church of Laodicea, man, I've heard of that a lot. This passage is misinterpreted a lot in our culture because of the fact is when we think of being hot, we think of that being on fire for God and cold being distant from God or cold with God. But they were actually two extremes. You'd have to go back to their culture. If I was to give an illustration today and I was to try to show tension of something, I would talk about the, the Buckeyes in Michigan, okay? And people would be like, oh, okay, I get that. All of these things, when he said, let me talk to the church of Laodicea, he was stepping into their culture so that people would know exactly what he was talking about. There was two cities that surrounded the church of Laodicea. So it said there was one to the left and one to the right of them. And the one to the, the, the left of them was Heropolis, seven miles away. This city was very famous. People would travel there to be part of that city, to, to, to go through there. It was kind of been like Hot Springs, Arkansas for us because this city had hot springs. Because they had this, they had these bathhouses and the saunas and stuff like that. People would travel around and they would go to that place to experience the things that they had for like entertainment and fun and vacationing and relaxation so when you would mention that city, people would be like, man, I love going there. It's like talking about going to Sandusky. You'd be like, oh, I love that because of the roller coasters. Well, I love this city because they have this outlet for us to do that. We travel up there. It's a fun place to be. Then there was Coloss. It was 11 miles the other way. They were known for their cold springs. Their cold springs would probably come out of the mountains or something like that. And that was a big deal. They didn't have refrigeration. They didn't have ice. I mean, some of those things that we take for granted all the time, they didn't have those things. So to be able to go to that city and experience cold water was a big deal. You guys know that when you're really hot, nothing in the world is better than ice cold water. You guys know what I'm talking about? It's just like, man, that is so good. It's so refreshing. So both of those cities were known for that. The Laodicea was way different. Laodicea didn't have either one of those resources. Actually, they were near the section of mountains over there, so the only way that they could get water, because they had no natural springs or anything, they, they created these aqueducts. They would create these, these things out of concrete and, and in stone. And they would funnel the water that came all the way from the mountains, and it would come all the way back down in the city, and then it would come out like a well or uh, like a spring, but it was all created by man. And by the time that it left the top of the mountain and flowed all the way through those and the sun coming down... It became lukewarm. It was not anything like the other cities. It was just blah. It's just nasty. It's gross. It, it, was, it was drank out of survival, but never for, for, for refreshment. It was never drank because somebody would say, hey, let's go to lay out a sea and get some of that water. Nobody wanted it. Jesus is talking to them about this. It's undesirable. It's gross. He said in verse 15, he says, I know thy works, that thou art either cold nor hot. He said, you're neither one of those cities. And they got that because it was part of their culture. It was part of whether. He said, I would that thou were cold or hot. He said, man, I so wish. I desire. I want this for you. It's what I have. He say, well, we don't live by those cities and I don't get that. So let's, let's do an illustration that we do get. Let's, let's find something from our culture that we understand. I'm going to speak your language, okay? Coffee. 
How many of you guys are hot coffee drinkers? Raise your hand or put in the comments. I want to hear you guys. If you're online, you're part of this. Put in there, hot coffee. My vote is hot coffee. How many of you guys are cold coffee drinkers or iced coffee drinkers? Okay, wow, this, this, this room's probably pretty much split on that. This is kind of a new thing to our culture. Hot coffee's been around forever. You guys already know that that's empty. Okay, so... <laughs> It's like, man, he's throwing that around. Uh, so the, 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 the comparison that these are quite different, that was the same thing he was saying with the two cities. But the idea that he was saying is both of these are quite different because they don't match anything around them. If you were to go to one city or the other words and you were to encounter that, you would be able to know really fast that there was something different about that, either cold or hot. It's one of my favorite illustrations that, I've, uh, that, that we have because it, it just is something we can understand. If I encountered this Christian, I mean, I'm going to know something's different. It's not like everything. If I, if I encountered this Christian, I'm going, to, I'm going to know something's different because of that. But it's not just itself. Something came into that. Either something heated that up to create that heat inside of that and something cooled that out and the ice inside of that changes it. It happened from the inside out to create a difference in it and it is radically different. And I know sometimes we can say the word radically and, and be, you know, like just a cool term, or whatever, but I'm telling you when it comes to this, it's not slightly, it's not off. It's literally saying that it is drastically different than anything around it. Now, let me, let me tie that into what Jesus was saying, because Jesus wasn't just talking about water. When you got saved, the Spirit of God came into your life and made you radically different than you were before. Can I get an amen on that? You're not the same. You are different. Or by the way, you are supposed to be different. Not the same as before. Okay is not okay because you are called to be passionate. You were created by God as a believer. When the Spirit of God came into your life, you were created to be passionate. You were called by God to be passionate. Ephesians 2, 1, and you have he quickened. That word quickened means to be made alive. You were dead. You were like everything else. You were lukewarm. You were stagnant before. God came into your life and you're like, wow, something drastically changed in my life. You are majorly different than you were before. Jesus was talking in John 10, 10. He said, I am come that you might have life. And we just say, oh, that's great. No, 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 no. And that you might have life more abundantly. Everything that God says in the Christian life, it was never lukewarm. It was never stagnant. It was never in the middle. It was never just okay. Never. You first get saved. You guys know what it's like. It's like, man, I can't get enough of that preacher. I've downloaded that podcast. I tune into this every week. I love hearing this preacher. I got this book. Man, I meet with my friends for Bible study. Man, did I tell you what I learned this week? Man, in my prayer life, I stepped out on faith. I started praying about this. Man, God did something. And then over time, you just get comfortable. You adapt. It's not exciting. You're not there. You're not craving anymore. Sometimes things become obligation and routines, traditions. Guys, you know, that can be a danger for us as Christians as we do something over and over and over again and nothing's special anymore. Nothing's alive. When you first got there, it's like every song that you sang is like, oh, that's cool. That's my favorite. No, that one's my favorite. You know, everything was new and exciting. And over time, sometimes for Christians now, it's like you sing a new song and we get upset about that. We, we, we don't want anything to change. We don't want anything new. We don't want anything fresh. We're just comfortable. God didn't create us to be comfortable. Never ever do you find that. Let's talk about this. How does this iced coffee and this hot coffee become lukewarm? You guys ready for this? This is how this happens. Do nothing. Do nothing. Just let it sit and slowly it will adapt to its surroundings around it. And then when you touch it, it's like, yeah, I don't get it. That's what happens to Christians. We live that passion for God, that thrive for God, that excitement for God. 
worship is just songs and, and reading is just let's get through this chapter and going to churches, what are we going to eat afterwards? And there's, nothing, there's no passion there. And Christians, the world gets around and says, I don't see the big deal. It's, it's, it's just, he's just another guy in school, just another guy at work, just another lady that I'm friends with. There's nothing different. It's just blah. I think of it as that shoulder shrug Christianity. You know what I'm saying? It's just like, how's things going with you all? Oh, you know, it's like, how's your passion for God? Oh, what did you read and discover from God this week? Well, I don't know. You know, just that, it's just the blah. It's just, I don't know. How is God working in your life right now? Went to church last Sunday. What are you looking for God to do right now in your life? What are you praying about? How are you serving God in a special way right now? Man, what has God put on your life? It's just like, oh, it's really busy, you know? I mean, life is crazy. It's just existent. You see, okay is not okay because you were called to be passionate, but also, let's just get real, because apathy is a sin. It's a sin. Now, if I was to get up here and vote and say, how many of you think murdering your neighbor is wrong? Every hand in this place would go up and say, yeah, Pastor Tony, Killing people is wrong. That's obvious. Do you guys realize that when he says in verse 19, he says, as many as I said this, and he tells them to repent of this sin that he's talking about because God tells you to repent of something that is wrong. Apathy is not just blah. It's a sin. So to have the attitude in your life that I, I'm not excited about anything spiritually and I'm not pursuing anything, I'm not stepping out on faith, or there's no sacrifice in my life, I'm not... It's not just a bad thing. It's sin. That's crazy because you realize that God can't bless sin. Any Christian that is going through life and you go up to him and say, man, how's God working in your life? And it's just the shoulder shrug. Then God says, man, I, I can't bless that. You're looking for revival. And God says, man, I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to get something that's better than okay in your life. Can you imagine Christ? Being that way with us? Before he went to the cross, he washed the disciples' feet. He got up from there and he went to the garden. And he prayed all night. He fasted, did not eat. And the Bible says that he prayed so earnestly that he sweat drops of blood. And he caught up and he surrendered himself. And he went to the cross and he was put on trial and he was beaten and all that. And the Bible describes that. We say this every Easter, the passion of the Christ. And then he says, follow me. Be like me. We proudly say the words, I am a Christian. Do you know what Christian is? A Christian means that you are like Christ. Can you imagine going to the garden and all this other stuff and Jesus being like, oh, I don't care. What's the big, I'm here. I showed up. No, it was the passion of Jesus Christ that saved us. Apathy is not just not okay with God. It is a sin. See, being okay is not okay, but the second thing he says, dear church, your apathy makes me sick. I mean, sometimes I think preachers say things like that to get that shock value of like, man, oh, man, that's a serious way to say that. Or man, he's getting really serious about this. Revelation 3.16, he says, so then... All right, because thou art lukewarm, because you've sat and there's nothing going on in your life and there's, there, there, there's no difference. He says, in neither cold nor hot, I'll spew you out of my mouth. Now, he's saying that in context of what it's like to drink lukewarm water when you're expecting it to be hot coffee or you're expecting it to be iced coffee and it sits in the sun and just kind of stagnates, just blah. I did a survey this week because I wanted to say with you guys what you think is gross. I started. I said, what did I say is gross? Yeah. Mayonnaise is disgusting. <laughs> Just do a vote right here in the church. How many of you agree that mayonnaise is gross? Raise your hand right now. The rest of you guys, that's what the altar is for. We're going to have prayer time <laughs> because you cannot take raw eggs and oil Blend it up and smear it on stuff and go, ooh, that is delicious. That's disgusting. You say, how did that happen? I think I got, I, 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 I messed up from my older brother. I'm messed up, okay? Mom, Denny would get up early. He was weird getting up early uh, on a school day. And so mom was like, you can help out by making the, the sandwiches. 
Now, back then, we didn't have the fancy school lunches and all. We went to a small Christian school, and, and so Denny would make the sandwiches. And back then, we, I'm so old, that was before we could afford, uh, afford the Ziploc top. That was for the fancy kids. You know what we had? The flip over the tabs. You know what I'm talking about? They'd have a thing, and it just, so the, your, your sandwich could kind of get, st- I'm getting off, okay? So anyways, we had the sandwich in the, the old funky bag, and it would, we would pull it out, and I would bite into that sandwich, and I think Denny scooped out the mayonnaise by a measuring cup instead of a, like a knife or something. It was just, and you'd bite into that and it would come out the sides and all over your fingers and it was like, oh, what is wrong with me? This white, goopy, nasty, gross stuff all over me. And it just, I think it messed with my mind. You guys are sitting there and thinking, we need counseling for our pastor. <laughs> he, he doesn't, Jenny knows, I, I, we love, I like going to Bibby Bop. And one of my favorite things was yum yum sauce. And then I found out that it was made, made with mayo, mayonnaise and it went in my head and I can't have yum yum sauce. And Jenny's like, what's wrong with it? You like yum yum sauce. I can't do it. It's in my head now because it's made with mayo. All right, I'm done with that. All right, just kids, say no to mayo. Say no. Just say no to it. That's all you have to do. So here, here are gross things, okay? I said things that are gross to you, and I actually had somebody, I was talking about food, and they said the Dallas Cowboys. That's not what I was asking. <laughs> the only one put there, oh, right, let's, let's just go through some, these are the top ones on the list, okay? Out of like 285 comments that you guys helped me out with this. One of the top ones is sushi is gross. If you agree with that, raise your hand. Wow, okay, for you sushi eaters, you are outnumbered at Fellowship Baptist Church. I don't agree with this one, but they said avocado is gross. Raise your hand. I, I've, I like me some guacamole. I'm sorry. It's green and it's weird looking, but it is so delicious. God made his own chip dip. How can you get upset with that? <laughs> mushrooms is gross. Raise your hand if you agree that mushrooms are gross. Okay, it's fungus, people. Do you want to know... If you can put athlete's foot powder on your pizza and your mushrooms disappear, something's wrong. That's gross. It's fungus. I I remember I I was like eating a sandwich and I I went into the cabinet and I got got the, the, the hamburger buns out and I was making a big sandwich and I wasn't paying attention and I put that thing in my mouth and I bit it and I'm like, whoa, that's, that tastes funny. I flip it over to the bottom of it. It was green and and fuzzy. It's gross. I didn't swallow the rest of the sandwich. I spit it out. You know why? It's because it was disgusting. Me and and my brothers, we were going to help some church people, and they they picked us up from our house, and they said they were going to go, and they stopped at this little redneck gas station in Alabama, went in and got chocolate milk. Does anybody know where I'm going with this? Chocolate milk was not created to be chunky. As soon as we started drinking, they were just like, blah, it was like gross. It was like way outdated. They they didn't know how to rotate or take out. It's gross. See, there's things that are in your life that you will say, that is disgusting to me. It doesn't match with who I am. It doesn't match with my palate. It doesn't match what I create and what I... God says when it comes to the apathy, when it gets in the mouth of God, that attitude or that mindset of a Christian is disgusting. I can't keep it. I, I, I have to spit it out. It's so gross. You think mayonnaise or whatever, but think about this is our God that has saved us and called us. And God doesn't say I spit the Christian out of my mouth. No, it's just I, I love my kids, but sometimes my kids can have a bad attitude. Sometimes we can all have a bad attitude. I love my kids, but I don't like the attitude. When Jesus was saying that mindset of the church, the mindset of my people, when I was called to be passionate, and Jesus did all that for us, and he came to seek and to save that which was lost, and Christians just have the uh, attitude, it's disgusting. Do we get it? It's not okay. And by the way, if this is anything that describes us, he says in Revelation 3.16, I'll spew you out of my mouth. I don't have to interpret that. I don't, I don't even have to like get really creative and trying to like, like say what, what God was trying to say there. God said it himself. 
Here's the other thing is the God's description of their apathy. Because because thou sayest I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. They probably would have laughed at this and was like, what? <laughs> oh, dude, uh, God, we love you and all, but that, that couldn't be further from the truth. That's, that's not us. If you have a fever, you say, I feel okay, but they come up to you, when your kids or whatever, and you're just like, oh, no, no, there's a sign right there that no, something's wrong, because you only have a fever if something is inter- internally wrong. See, what Jesus was saying, you might not feel like you're poor and miserable and wretched and all these things, but he said, in reality, you are. And sometimes you don't know how poor and wretched and all these things. He said, poor, literally naked. He said, you're missing something that should be there. It's like saying you're iced coffee and you go, no, uh, there's no ice in that. I I can feel it. And this is hot coffee and you feel it. It's like, no, there's... That's not hot at all. Some things, I, I don't know what you ordered, what you were expecting it to be, but it's not that. Something is wrong with that. Apathy is the description, like a Christian having a fever, something is not right internally. And on the outside, you might be thinking that you're right, right but he was described, he said, you're wretched. And you know how many families think that they're okay because I go to church, I go to church, I show up, I do all these things, and then problems come into their life and they just fall apart? Oh, man, I don't know. We're not going to make it. Ah, because they weren't ready for it. Because you're thinking, I'm just okay, but you were never called to be just okay. You were called to be strong, be strong in the Lord, in the power of his might. Run the race. Fight the good fight. Everything that you read about God is never just, uh, it's never just passive. It's fervent in spirit, striving together more abundantly above average what he said see it bothers God because you were not meant to be any of those things see apathy means that you stopped stepping on on faith you stopped fasting and praying you stopped your witness you, you stopped praying for bigger things you stopped praying those prayers that scare you you stopped those things that you, you just have gotten comfortable he says in verse 18, he said, I counsel thee. He puts it on their level. He said, you're increased with goods and have need of nothing. It's like, man, we go to the store and buy anything they want. And he's putting it on their level. And he says this, he said, I counsel thee. Let me give you some advice. Let me tell you what's right. To buy of me gold, try to, this. now that God's selling this, you understand, he's putting it on their level. God communicates things so that we will understand it. We'll get it. But he said, I counsel thee to buy of me uh, gold, tried in the fire. He said, what I have is literally pure and right. What I give you in your life, what I want to give you is so much better than what you're going to get from the world. It satisfies. It, it, it's peace. It's strength. Clothe yourself this way. Don't be naked. Get, let me give you, and he goes to this description saying you're missing something. Dear church, okay is not okay. Dear church, your apathy makes me sick. Dear church, here's the shocker. I love you. Whoa. I would have been like, what? What did you just say? You just said my attitude makes you sick. Then he says in verse three, uh, uh, chapter 3, verse 19, he says, as many as I love, I love you. Church, I love you. We are witnessing true love right here. It's, it's love that doesn't give up. It doesn't walk away. It doesn't, it doesn't leave you in your apathy. God looks at you in that relationship and he says, I'm not going to leave you there. Listen to what it is. See, true love confronts. In Revelation 3, 19, he says the word, as many as I love, I, he says, I love you. And he says, because I love you, I rebuke you. The word rebuke literally means to call out a fault. See, see, there's a lot that we could learn in this. When you truly love someone, you won't just leave them in their mess. If you love them. Well, that's none of my business. What? No, Jesus sat there saying with that apathy, you come lukewarm, there's nothing good, you're going to fall apart. You're going to encounter problems and there's going to be no strength in you. There's no passion. You're never going to make a difference for Christ. Like your, your family's never going to want what you want because you're so passive. And he literally says, it's not okay. It's awesome. I rebuke you. I'm going to call you out on this. 
it's a wonderful thing when God brings you to a church service or you tune in online like some of you are doing right now and God literally says to you in that moment, I'm not giving up on you. As passive as you are, as apathetic as you are, God says, I'm not, I'm not going to leave you like that. This is, we say that, but look, look how it would be. God would say, you know that you have more passion preaching about politics than you do about preaching about me. Hey, should we talk about politics and what's right and wrong and the issues of America, I'm American or whatever? Yeah, vote, do what's right, know biblically what's right. But I promise you, your voice should never be louder for a president or a candidate or a party than it is for Jesus Christ. This world doesn't need the next person wearing a red or blue tie. What they need is Jesus Christ. And if you're a candidate for Jesus Christ, you are the, the ambassador. If you are the witness, then they should be hearing that above everything else. You're saying, I shouldn't talk about Yes, yeah, say what's on your heart. Be truthful. Be honest. Be loving. Be loving. They shall know you by your democratic part. Oh, no, no. They shall know you by your love. Okay, I get that mixed up. They shall know you by your love. Your love. Should, should pass that line of I disagree with you. No, but I still love you. Jesus said, you make me sick, but I still love you. I love you. So I'm going to call you out of that. The, the next thing he says in chasten, that chasten literally means to pull back. It doesn't just mean to rebuke or correct. It literally means if I saw my kid playing in the street, I'm going to go out there and say, you shouldn't be out there. And then I'm going to grab him by the hand and pull him back. Jesus' goal in this is to pull us back in relationship with him. See, True love confronts and true love restores. How do you restore passion? Now, I'm going to get real with this because I've preached messages parallel to this and even out of this passage before that I say, stop being lukewarm. You should be hot. You should be cold. You should be different. There should be something in there. And it's like, okay. And then we're like, okay, I shouldn't be that way. I'm sorry. Uh, what now? You know what I'm saying? This getting lukewarm didn't happen overnight. If I was to do this, and even I use this in the first service, it's already melting, but it's not there yet. It takes time. You didn't become lukewarm overnight. And let me tell you, you're not going to just become passionate the way you should be by flipping a spiritual switch in your heart. I wish it was that way. And I'll prove it. It's restoring the relationship. In 1995, I met Jenny for the first time. She was just, at that time, in my heart, a cute blonde that I wanted to know her more. I approached her, I asked her out, and we began the talk. Casual. I, I mean, if I saw her, great. If I didn't, it was okay. I didn't know her that well. One time I asked her, I said, hey, what would you think about us breaking off from the group that we were hanging out with and just going up to the social hall? There was this place that you could just go hang out. It was filled with couches. It was designed for college students to fall in love, okay? So we, we go and sit on that couch, and we begin to talk about life and our future and what we like, and we're laughing and we're talking. And, and I remember leaving and going back to the dorm, and all the other guys were like, what's what's wrong with you? You're all giddy or whatever. I was like, they were like, he was with Jenny, you know, tonight. I was like, oh, be quiet. You know, just like, but there's, you know, you're just excited. There's happy. It was like, it was just, I, I had a great night. I learned some things and she kind of hinted that she liked me a lot. And, you know, just, you know, it's kind of exciting of doing that. I, I remember that kept growing and, and changing. And I remember the more we did that, the more I began to cancel all the things that I was doing with my guy friends of going to, to play racquetball and we would go bowling and we'd do all this. And I'd say, can Jenny come? Or tonight I'm going to spend the evening with Jenny. And I, I, we would go do things like that. Nobody had to say, Tony, you need to stop doing things. You need to stop paying more attention to Jenny. No, it was, it was a natural thing that was happening in my life. It was natural to be there. It was just the more I got to know her, the more I wanted to get to know her. And the more I got to know her, the more I would sacrifice to get to know her. I remember I would, I would, I would take my homework time, and I'm like, i got to do this project. I'm going to go out with Jenny. And then I'd go out with Jenny. And then I would go back to the dorm and I remember staying up with a light underneath the covers and sitting there for hours doing the homework to the wee hours in the morning because I wanted to give up that time to be with the girl that I loved. 
where I was falling in love with. It was an organic thing that happened in there. It was natural. You say, wow, that was random. Okay, uh, Revelation 3.20. Behold. Now, now, we use this verse a lot, but take it in context. Behold. Hey, I, I need you to see something. I need your attention. Behold. I stand at the door. And I knock. You know what this is? I need to get your attention. I want you, but I need you to respond. I need you to respond. I'm not going to force it. Jesus doesn't come up and kick open the door and say, You're going to love me. You know, you're going to have passion for me. You make me sick. You know, not that Jesus is a worldwide wrestler or anything, but I'm just, but there's this desire that he had, and he makes it so obvious. I stand at the door and I'm knocking, I'm wanting you, I'm, I'm pursuing you. But you have to respond. And he says the whole key to having passion, he says, and if any man will open the door, I'm going to come right in, and I'm going to sup with him and he with me. We're going to sit down, and we're going to have dinner. And it's not going to be serving God. It's not going to be outlines. It's not, it's not going to be building and projects and running and doing and rules and all this. And he said, I just want to sit just want to know you. I want you to know me because I tell you, the more you know Jesus, the more you're going to love him. And I love him. Do you know why? Because he first loved me. Do you know why Revelation starts off in the first letter he writes? He said, I have someone against thee because you left your first. You left your first love. Seven letters. And he comes right back to it. I love you. I love you. I love you. And all I want is to sit with you. But if you're inside and he's knocking on the door, every service and every worship song and every devotion that he's doing, and he's saying, where are you? And you're in there playing your video games and you're in there consumed with your future and you're in there talking about politics and you're so consumed with everything else that you don't have time for a relationship with God. The more distant you become from your spouse, the less passion you'll have for them. Can I tell you something that's shocking, that just blew my mind, and for you, you'd be like, maybe that's, but the love of God, and he says, as many as I love, he says that in that verse, as many as I love, what is the love of God in Greek? Who can yell it out for me? Yell it out. Agape. Agape. It's unconditional love. Literally meaning, I'll love you no matter what. So guess what? That is not agape. I was reading that, and I was like, whoa, wait a minute. I literally wrote it in my notes as agape, because God's love is agape. And then when he's writing this, he didn't use the word agape. He used the word phileo. It's another Greek word for, for love. It is a friendship, companionship, relationship love. We have, when we come to church and we say, man, I really love you, it's I'm not an unconditional love. It should be because of the love of Christ in us, but because I'm not God, I struggle with that. But it's a matter that I care about you. I want to see you. How you doing? How's your week? Are, is your family okay? It's a filial love. Literally what he was saying, it's not that it's not unconditional, but what God's desire for you is he says, I want to spend time with you. And I promise you, when you do, true passion for God will only come from a true relationship with God. Do you guys get that? You say, I want to be passionate. That is why I love the fact that every one of us gets on Sunday morning. We have two services and everyone's able to come in here and hear the word of God. It is great that you serve and praise God that you serve. But I'll tell you, nothing replaces the preaching of the word of God. Because I love him. And he loves me. And I need that time to worship and to talk to him and for him to talk to me. Because I tell you, I fell in with Jenny, sitting down, being able to share my heart on a couch and on a chair and in a restaurant and over chicken tenders and everything else. And God says, what I need from you is to stop everything else. Stop. 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 Just open the door. Open the door. And I'm just going to come in, and I'm going to sit down. I want to hear from you. 
and you're going to hear from me. Because what that leads into is the fact that God has called us to go all out. Do you hear me? God says at the end of this, it's time to go all out. Something happened. So here we are, we're dating and all this is going on. We had church in the morning, had church in the evening. Jenny didn't go to church. I was asking my friends and those, where's Jenny? Does anybody know where Jenny is? We didn't have cell phones. We didn't have text messages. We didn't have all those things back then. So you just didn't know. They say, you didn't hear? Jenny's really sick. She doesn't feel good. There's no way on campus to be able to go off. She didn't have a car. She didn't, she didn't have it, all those things. So I was like, I was looking at my watch. I didn't have very much money. I was broke as can be. I was looking at my watch and I was like, if, if I leave right now, I might, I might break curfew. Or what? I don't care. And I ran out to my car and I went to the store and I got medicine that I knew that she'd need. I got orange juice and I got some snacks that I knew that she liked. And I wrote a note and, I, and I'm running on campus. I spent every dime that I had was, that was, should have been for gas. And, and, I, and I put it all together and I put it in a box and I ran it to one of her friends. And I said, just go bring this to Jenny. It was like a get well box. I just wanted her. And she, she opened it up and I sacrificed and I did all that stuff and I was running and everything. And you say, who made you do that? Nobody. I did it because I loved her. I loved her. I didn't, I've never even said that to her, but I loved her. I was in love with her. You guys get passion for God as a natural response when you love him. I can't make it. I can't tell. I could preach a thousand messages. Be hot for God. Be cold for, well, yes, yeah, be hot for God. <laughs> You're gonna be like, I'm gonna do it right now. I'm just like, dude, I'm changed now. I love God with all my heart. It doesn't work that way. You don't flip a switch. You don't. You open the door. You let him in turn off the TV, you turn off Facebook, you turn off news, you turn off CNN, you turn off Fox, you turn it all off. And you just talk to him. And he talks with you. If I don't fully understand this, come back next week, you will, because we're going to roll right into that. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous. Almost the, the final punch of this whole thing that God is driving us to. I need my people to match the DNA of our Savior. Or he, he needs us to match. Be zealous. The, 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 the word zealous means to come to a boiling point or to be hot or to be fervent, to be different. God has never called us to be okay. He's never called us just to exist. We're not here just to go by. We are called to be on fire for God. I, don't, don't hate me for this. And I'm not totally upset that we went through COVID. I hate, and I know I've said this over and over again. Because I think God literally just stripped our table of everything that we had. And we're so busy and running and running and running and running. And all of a sudden, maybe, have you ever thought that God is doing things just to take things off of the table saying, now do you have time for me? Now do you have time for me? Now do you have time for me? Now can you see me? Can you see me? America? that's been increased with goods and you have need of nothing? What you need is me because you're actually blind and you're wretched and you're miserable and you're weak and you need me because he needs us to be the fire for God in the last days. He needs us to be on fire for God. We need to run to the giants. We need to stand in the lion's den. We need to march, march around the walls of Jericho. We need to be able to run up against the enemies of Satan against the prince of power of the air, against the darkness of this world. And we're never going to do it if we're just okay. You'll never do it when you're passive. You'll never do it when you're just existing. When you never do it when somebody says, what's, what's going on in your life? And you're like, I'm here. I went to church. I'm okay. Okay is not okay with God. 